how's it in the name of Christ? How you doing? It's your girl, Crank K. I hope you're good. I hope you're peachy. I hope you're still up. And I hope you're eating meat well, Bunch. If you're not, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, life is hard, okay? Especially for the body of Christ. So, we're in this together. Okay, so I just want to rock up and I want to encourage some people. Because that's just what it is that we ought to do. The Bible says that we must encourage one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I'm here to encourage with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh... Please don't mind my obvious wig. My hair is a royal mess right now. And we are not trying to have anybody see it. Okay, guys, I, yeah. Where shall I commence with, with the story? <sighs> okay, look, flexing. You know, when I was in, in the Kishion making my coffee, we've got coffee today. When I was in the in the Kishion, my coffee's got herbs and everything in it. So when it's, it's yeah, when, when you see things floating around, it's herbs and like spices. I like it that way. Mm. When I was in the Kishion making this beverage, I was looking at God and thinking at God and being like, I need maturity. I need maturity. I need I need maturity and I need humility. And I know that oftentimes when we ask for humility and maturity from you, God, you bring it through hardship. You know, God will put you through some stuff. He will put you through waters. You you out your be asking the Lord, for instance, Father, please bless me with a husband. And on top of that, please make me the kind of woman that would be really great and fit for purpose for a godly man. So you ask God to groom you to be godly. And then you ask him to give you a husband. And you think that he's just going to go and be like, Quing, it is done. Much like the way that magic works. That's why we are servants of light, uh, belonging to the kingdom of heaven, and not so much servants of darkness. Because what it is that we ask for in prayer does not get awarded us through a magic trick. It's not the waving of a wand or a hand or whatever that then just gives you what you asked for. It tends to have a process. People into dark arts, the thing that lures them to dark arts is the instant gratification promise or nature of magic okay let me open the door because i really don't want this phone to overheat the thing that draws them to the kingdom of darkness is is just the instant gratification like getting what you want without waiting without waiting that's the disquieting thing about darkness okay mm. mm -hmm. darkness is a quick win it's a quick fix it is something that just comes at you like at a bullet speed and uh, however it tends to have all these flukes and flaws in it uh, a woman again let's continue to use the whole example of looking for uh, asking god for a husband you know if she is a magician a sorcerer a sorceress or one who trusts in such powers as these when she is frustrated that she's getting older and not yet married she will go and consult the sangoma and be like make my boyfriend marry me or bring a man into my life that he might marry me and whatever comes is just going to be so shoddy uh, the, the boyfriend in question, if at all you had to manipulate him using sorcery to get him to marry you, first and foremost, he was wasting your time, he was stringing you along, and he didn't really want to marry you, and you made him. So how's that going to work out in the end? What's that going to look like? Because witchcraft has an expiration date. When it expires, the people snap out of a love buzz, a love trance, uh, yeah, and then they realize that what did I do? I didn't sign up for this. And when you, when they're there, that, that's when they get mad at you, angry at you. That's when they start to cheat. That's when they start to look at you like, what are, what am I doing here? Okay, yeah, so it's got glitches and twitches and tweaks that are ugly. Uh, like, yeah, proper. Only God can give a good and a perfect gift. Good, every good and perfect gift is from above and from the Father of heavenly lines. You cannot get a good gift in any way but from God. Let's just put that out there. Or if it's a man that you have not yet met uh, and then you're like just bring one along please i'm sick and tired of waiting sangoma what's gonna come what's gonna come the kingdom of darkness the people who capitulate or respond to spells uh they they're not christians we can't be cursed we don't just go at the whim being pulled by the nose of satanic um you know trances spirits just bringing us in and we just go with the wave it's not what we do right so those who do get caught in the crosshairs of being lured by spirits are unbelievers unfortunately they're unbelievers and unbelievers are not being you know sanctified by the holy spirit they're not being made to put to death the deeds of the body they are therefore operating in the fruit of the sinful nature 
as it is written in Galatians 5. And so there is a very huge risk that they may rock up with some, you know, insatiable character flaws. Frankly, insurmountable, unsurvivable, insufferable, and uneducated. Character flaws that are going to be the bane of your existence. You, you are luring to yourself. You are luring to yourself a person that could not resist witchcraft. They could not resist the devil that he might flee from him. A person that was just taken by the tsunami of sorcery, meaning that not only can you bewitch him, but everybody else can. And so your husband is essentially up for grabs. Your new boyfriend that's going to finally propose is now up for grabs by anyone that has got more powerful witchcraft than either you or your sangoma, right? Because that's how like the kingdom of darkness works. It's rank. So if somebody that has more rank then your Sangoma or you, depending on who is the the, the, the practitioner in question, if you're self-practicing, then it would be you. Yeah, if somebody with greater rank pulls this man by the nose, he will just stop looking at you. So you've got a basically unstable boyfriend slash gonna be husband one day that could slip through the cracks of your fingertips and you therefore be left high and dry after a season of being excited that a husband came along. Not only that, there are the possibilities of flaws just heinous flaws in character because they are not in christ and when a person is not in christ there is no explaining or understanding what under heaven they could do mm, how they could act on you it's written in god's word that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it so you don't know what this guy can do and if he has no holy spirit to brittle the deeds of the body you're, you're bringing not only a nooseable guy, he is a tetherable guy, a dude that can be brought in with a noose or a tether. And anybody can just tw twist and turn from by every wind of doctrine because, or, or every wind of witchcraft. Like this guy is takeable with spirits. So anyone can take him. That's the first risk. And secondly, not saved. So character flaws. And he's not going to therefore have an incentive to love you the way that Christ loved the church. And when witchcraft expires, he could also then snap out of it and be like, but I don't even like you. Instant gratification produces what would be the tenement of a botched outcome, botched jobs. It, it brings a situation on board that starts to grow fur and fangs and a tail. It mutates. It starts to look kind of alien. It has problems. Like the gifts of the devil always have a future cancer on it. There, there is a tumor in the provision of Satan. There is always a tumor and it, it, it tends to be malignant it is never benign and it also metastasizes at re metastasizes at record speeds mm. one minute it's at stage one next minute it's at stage five about to enter the casket that is just the very nature of getting stuff through witchcraft it's quick it's quick but it twitches it's quick but it's unstable it glitches it's quick but it's frustrating and it's quick, but it's unsustainable and insufferable. It's quick and it uh, sometimes manifests fur. Like I said, it grows fangs and wings and tails. <laughs> you don't want something metastasizing on you like a cancer that is disturbing, neither growing fur, mutating in front of you, making like an X-Man. You don't want that. And the best way to make sure that you are not going to get a mutating gift <laughs> It's not really a gift, therefore it's a curse. You're gonna wait on God. You're gonna wait on God, right? Instant gratification that comes through sorcery brings things that are shoddy, that crack later. And by later, I mean literally within two seconds because sometimes it can crack ever so immediately all up in your girl. It's disappointing. The things of Satan are disappointing. Go and ask any woman that has tried to fall pregnant through darkness what the devil has done once this woman fell pregnant what what the devil insisted upon concerning this child this kid will one day inevitably either turn themselves over to darkness or they will be the bane of the mother's existence or as a child something will be awry they will have fur and mold growing on them they, there's always mold and fur growing on satan's provision it's not really provision it always comes with horrible fine print that a lot of people don't want to read okay and this instant gratification nature of the acquisition of Satan's presence is the very way that he lures people in the kingdom of darkness. He, 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 he appeals to humans' impatience. He appeals to the lack of patience in us. The fact that we just want stuff and we want it now. We love to make money quickly. We love to uh, graduate quickly. We, we love easy ways out. It's just our nature. 
We are born dead in trespasses and sins, and among the sins that we are naturally just kind of gliding in is laziness. We are lazy to work, and we are lazy to wait. That's why God has to keep on giving us instructions to work by the sweat of our brow, and that if anybody does not want to work, let them not eat. He also tells us that, wait, wait for the Lord, be patient. Don't grow weary of doing good. In due season, you will reap the peaceful fruit of righteousness if you don't give up. Okay, you don't want a gift that's growing fur, that's oozing pus. You don't. Mm. Granted that satanic provision has all these issues, it is therefore worth the while to peruse godly provision. It's worth it. It takes a minute to get to your doorstep, but you don't want something with mold and peach fuss on it. <laughs> you don't. Okay? We, we understand, we comprehend fully that sitting around waiting can hurt. And uh, the reason why it hurts is because I I'm here to comfort myself, right? And so I'm, I'm hoping to comfort others with the same speech, with the same conversational points. Okay? Um, there's a, a, a little school kid uh, outside playing with my cat. Anyway, it, it hurts because when you are waiting, everybody is getting what you're waiting for first. When you are waiting, everybody's getting the job first. When you are waiting, everybody's getting the husband or the wife first. When you are waiting, everybody is getting the the, the business success, the break, the big break first. When you are waiting, when you are waiting, you get my point. You appear in the run-up to the acquisition of what it is that you waited for to be just passed up. And so tend to also be generally underestimated because of you having not gotten to where everybody else is getting to them. When you are waiting, everybody runs past you. And that hurts. Because the people that run past you, right, that, that you are waiting, uh, that, that you are waiting in front of, uh, tend to be your peers. So people with whom you naturally, by society, tend to be compared. All right? I can't help but look outside as to what's going on. You tend to be generally compared with these people. You, there is a barometer against them this barometer you are measured so you are looked at as unsuccessful lacking in prosperity you are looked at as a no-brainer essentially uh and it hurts when people underestimate you like that it hurts when people don't know what your true girth is what you can do it hurts when people don't recognize that you're actually really hard working the only reason you are put maybe let's say your situation is unemployment is because you just have not yet quite hit your big break your big break you are not you are in a pursuit in the pursuit of happiness but you're not yet there and in the run-up to in this interim phase from point one to z yeah yeah people are just flying right by your nose they are soaring like birds and people are comparing you to them and this therefore makes you feel small you feel belittled you feel microscopic infinitesimal you feel like an exaggerated failure and so for those reasons you are in a lot of pain not only do you feel behind in comparison to everybody else but people see it fit to also make it clear that you are behind in comparison to everybody else like they just keep reminding you of stuff that frankly you already know uh not only uh, is everybody gliding right by you, your nose, flying, soaring, speed boating past you? Sometimes they are malicious too. That's why waiting hurts, right? Sometimes they're malicious. Sometimes they are mean about it. Sometimes they make it clear that I'm here and you're not there. My husband is better than yours, or I have a husband at all, or I have a career better than yours, or I have a career at all. Yeah, you get some petty people on the earth roaming around in these streets that will slather you with that they will throw it in your face that they are better off than you because they've been competing with you since you were just two years old and as you got older when then they got first what it is that you wanted to they will slap you with it they will clobber you with it they will slather it on your face like vaseline on the face of an african child going to school from mama they will put it all up in your grill and make it evident that you're not where they're at. They might be subtle with it because they're not those outwardly heinous meanies. Or they might be just over it because they don't care to protect your feelings. The worst ones are the ones that are subtle. The ones that are not making it clear that I am flexing and I'm boasting. 
and I am showing you that I am bigger than you. The worst are those. It's easier to take in your stride the person that's like, whatever, carabo, you ain't got a husband. <laughs> Nobody loves you. You look at them on some goodness you mean and your pity. Just by mere virtue of them having that character flaw, you sometimes feel okay about this, the situation because it, it takes a, a horrible, wretched character in a person to gloat over that which a person doesn't have. So when this person is like a bit of a penina in the Bible, Outwardly just mocking Hannah. It hurts, but it's like you're mean. That character flaw is the reason why I'm bigger than you. I'm better than you because I'm not mean to you. And on top of that, it, things never end well for people like you. You know, you, you're the ones that laugh first, literally too soon, and then somebody else walks up in the picture later and laughs last. You're mean, so you comfort yourself with the fact that they're mean. So the, the outwardly mean ones are still hurtful, but not nearly as much as the subtle guys the subtle guys that will slather their prosperity in your face without saying a word the ones that will insist on raving their brand spanking new suv outside of your apartment that they have just bought just to show you that you're still driving that old scud donkey that gets stuck every so often on battery <laughs> yeah look at my car and they're not gonna say look at me drive this car they will just make sure that they rev it outside of your house mm. They will just make sure they rev it outside of your house. Oh, they will. Actually, my ex-boyfriend, he was trying to be that kind of subtle ridiculousness. He confessed it to me one time. Uh, I, 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 I hooked up a closure meeting with him because we broke up horribly. It was just nasty and yeah. And seeing as we were together for so long, I was like, this is not the way that people should be that were together for that long. You literally took a whole bunch of years of my life. So when somebody has got that much memory in my lifespan, I'm not gonna, I don't want to be on bad ground with them. I don't want to have, imagine that those are the worst five years of my life. Like I just, no. Yeah, so I wanted nice closure. I wanted closure so that I could look back as like at, at that situation and be like, we did it. And yeah, okay, we broke up, it didn't work out. But without there being like bad energy, like if I were to bump into him at the mall, I wanted to be able to be like, hi, what's up? And move on without me being like, nah, or whatever. So I hooked up a closure meeting with him uh, after that fiery breakup. Mm -hmm. uh, about a couple of months after the fiery breakup. And he calmed down too because of that closure meeting. So my desire for cordiality inspired cordiality in him too. He realized that it's, it's not worth it to be all pity at this point. Let's just, you know, be adults about it. So because he chilled and he stopped being mad at me too, he confessed a little something something that was going on in that human heart of his that is that was that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And told me at this luncheon that we were having that I was so mad at you that I wanted to build myself a house right by him because he was getting into construction he was like i wanted to basically build a beautiful house for myself and then invite you to the housewarming with some beautiful girl by my side so that you could really feel the pain of dumping me <laughs> i listened to this guy literally tell me what he was planning on doing to make me feel like trash <laughs> And him on some clearly you did not know me we did it all that time and you never took notes you just did not that stuff would not have worked first and foremost i would not have gone to your housewarming i would have literally left it in the past given how badly we broke up i was not going to insist on pitching at anything you invited me to and secondly even if i was to go because i'm dumb i was not going to be saddened by that ridiculousness because of the fact that i would have seen it for exactly what it was but that whole that whole attempt at breaking my heart where it is that he would invite me to a beautiful home that he has built carrying some beautiful woman on his shoulders <laughs> that 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 is the, the, the that that is a subtle slathering and clobbering and like spraying it and sprinkling it in a person's face type gloat like yeah throwing it in their face that that is that is subtle it, it's subtle but it's a clobber it's a slathering like vaseline on an african child's face and the mama's care yeah that is a vaseline clobber okay that is a slather a smear that is a smearing in the face but in a way that's subtle it's not necessarily saying look at me i have a better girl than you look at me i have a better house than you it's hey come see me friend you and i we're, we're buddies chest bump Gah. um 
I bought a house, so I just wanted to invite you to the housewarming. <laughs> and then and then you go, and this dude is out here literally just being like, look at my beautiful girl, and look at my beautiful house. But without saying it in so many words, that is a subtle slather. And it is subtle, subtle slathers that hurt the most. Because the people don't say in so very many words that they are smearing it in your face, that they're doing much better than you, that they are where it is that you are supposed to be, or beyond, and... You're just frankly never gonna catch up. They they wear this air of you're never gonna catch up. They they thoroughly blubber you with I'm here and you're not and dream on. It's just not gonna happen. You're not gonna catch you. Whoa. Mm. The subtle slather hurts because you can pick it up. You're not dumb. You thankfully understand sarcasm, and so for those reasons, you know what they're doing. But because they haven't said it in so many words. Uh, you you just have to take it in your stride and literally continue to congratulate them and be like, that's good for you. <laughs> yeah, um, oh, yeah, wow, you've done well. I'm so proud of your accomplishments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. You have to basically be mature about it because they have not outwardly been immature. You, you can't, therefore, react by saying, why are you smearing this in my face? Because their response is going to be, I don't know what you're talking about. I just want, I just invited you to my house because I respected you as a friend and I wanted you to be part of something big that I was doing. And I, and now you're, you're accusing me of smearing this in your face like, girl, like how, how could you think that about me? And then this narcissist will then make you feel like you are some jealous freak that just can't be happy for people when they're the ones that smeared it in your uneasy fizzite. They're the ones that smeared it in your face, okay? They clobbered you with their success in a way that they knew would hurt. Especially, especially if they have been privy to whatever it is under heaven that delayed your success, your advancements in that particular field or area. If they are aware of the chock blocks you faced and the challenges and they have no compassion or empathy towards them, that's when it hurts especially deeply because you're supposed to be bigger than that. You, you, you cannot be throwing this in my face because you're my girl. And you should know that I'm in pain because I had to drop out of university due to the fact that my mother was not paying my fees. That's why I'm not, I'm not graduating with you at the same time, girl. We did lectures together. We were in the same year together. We were doing well together. At some point, we were studying together. But I had to drop out, not because I just wanted to leave school, but simply because my parents were not able to afford fees. So I'm kind of delayed and I am yet to get what it is that I wanted because life happened. So when a person knows your challenges and they're still clobbering you with Vaseline, smearing it in your face like an African child about to go to school. Mm. But it's subtle. You got to just swallow that tough pill. You got to just take it. You, like, you, know, you got to swallow it like a big fat chunky antibiotic when you've got pneumonia and, and, and deal. <laughs> you just got to swallow it and not make it clear that you are aware of what they're doing. They're using psychological gains all up in your grill. It's reverse psychology. It's gaslighting. It's, um, it's, it's, what do you call this? It's spawning, man. It's, it's games. This person is playing games. They are lacking empathy and compassion and sympathy for your case. Evidenced by how it is that they are gloating over the fact that you were set up for failure or you were met with a hindrance that made it such that the competition the two of y'all were feverishly in once upon a time, they were given an advantage by mere virtue of them having parents that paid their fees all the way up until they finished varsity, whereas you had to drop out because your parents just dropped the ball on paying fees. In the case of the university graduation uh, scenario, yeah, you were, you were set back by something that they are aware of because they're your peoples and they lack empathy concerning that. It is those that are, are subtle that hurt the most. The ones that will pull the stunt that my ex tried to pull on me, who won't necessarily say, look, Garabo, I can do better than you. And on top of that, I can get a big house and be the kind of man that every woman wants. Right after you dump me, look at how successful I am. He wanted to slather me with that. And he confessed it. <laughs> that, that's what he wanted to do. And I, I, I laughed when he told me. Um, but the, his bitterness, in the season of his bitterness, he was literally plotting and scheming this heinous plan. This plot was at the top of his brain. And he confessed it only once I got cordial with him. Those subtle below the belt uh, carpet... Those subtle below the belt car carpet pullings are the ones that hurt the most. The people that know your story, know your pain, know what you've been through, know that you were sent back, know where you could be but aren't there, know that you are paying 
redeemed by the inability to get to where it is that you wanted to get and yet nonetheless do not care that that that's your pain they, they don't care that 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 is your your struggle are uh, irreverent for the fact that th these here are your spiritual challenges in terms of maintaining a particular godliness or character in spite of what you're going through have no regard for your coping state and how rough it is to achieve such a coping as that and in spite of all that still clobber you with that vaseline slather it on your face like you is an african child about to go to school and dealing with an african mama that ain't got no respect for the fact that your peers in school don't like that tease you for shining like that okay could be the bananas yeah the subtle guys are the worst and the subtle guys are the ones that encircle my particular life uh that that glare that go with the car that goes okay those insensitive ones that slather you subtly not so much revving their car outside of your apartment so you can see that hmm, me i got a better car than yours i just bought it you and your sedan that keeps on choking up with exhaust fumes every time you start it yeah i got a car that's better than yours I, I, they, they they hurt but it's much easier to take them in your stride because you can always comfort yourself in the fact that but your character is flawed you are like penina mocking hannah the ones that will break your heart are the ones that are like yeah, I, I can't even find a, a, a character in the bible that that was like that that was gloating over somebody that spoke to like basically somebody yeah i'll, I'll actually I, I do yes um the ones that are subtle with their acquisitions there is actually a character that i just found at the top of my mind right ray not rachel but leah 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 was the subtle slatherer the subtle globara leah was the subtle globara leah to rachel was a subtle globara you will remember how it is that rachel was the loved wife of of um jacob right leah was the trick wife she was the one that was given him via trickery through death through the dad of the girls so she was not beloved not not that much anyway by jacob and Ra rachel and leah sorry envied therefore her sister rachel for those reasons and she because of the fact that her husband did not love her the most god opened her womb leah that is first so god blessed leah first with children because it was comforting to her to at least be able to bear children for this man and rachel's womb was closed for the sake of leah feeling kind of left out of the party so god had leah's back in that regard by giving her that favor but leah was not necessarily appreciative of it because at the end of the day she was still not the loved wife and what she then did was essentially mock rachel with her fertility and her children but without saying that you're infertile you know how panina was outwardly to hannah like you're infertile she could kind of babies like there's nothing to write home about with you you're half a woman you're barely a woman you're a quarter of a woman because you can't have babies that that was that was that was um panina she was below the belt and driving a car outside of an apartment of a person whose car chokes up some crazy colored exhaust fumes rachel however was a subtle person that invites you to a housewarming with a better girlfriend by the side basically gloating and clobbering you in the face however not saying it in so many words and if you raise it you are going to look petty and jealous as rachel as rachel you're going to look when you raise the fact that you pay you know that this person is pulling that stunt all up in your grill your awareness of it they're gonna say they're gonna deny it they're gonna gaslight the living death out of you they're gonna be like i don't know what you're talking about how, what makes you think i'm like that i'm not that kind of girl like how could you i just wanted you to be part of my life yeah the subtle people that'll gas you into thinking that you, you're so jealous that you can't be happy for a person that's trying to show you their happy life right uh, leah was like that you will recall the story in the bible with the mandrakes the the son's mandrakes how it is that leah refused to give rachel mandrakes because they were her son's main mandrakes you want to take my son's mandrakes i don't want you taking my son's mandrakes she didn't say i got sons i got kids and you ain't got jack she was just making it clear that i have a son and he got mandrakes and you be trying to take my son's mandrakes 
No. She is saying, you ain't got sons. To have mandrakes. She was saying, you ain't got sons to have mandrakes in the first place. And on top of that, I, I, I believe by the day, what was... Did Rachel already have... No, no, no. Look, did Rachel already have Joseph by then with the son's mandrakes issue? I can't recall. I don't think so. And Leah was just out here basically refusing to give her sister or share with her sister or be cordial with her sister. Something that really and truly... Nobody would miss these mandrakes if at all you split them in three or two between people. Yeah, but Leah made it a big thing that was not even a big thing. And Rachel could tell that this was because Leah is literally coming at her because her husband loves her more. Her husband loves her more. Jacob loves Rachel more. And Leah, in her jealousy, acted in ways so as to use what are her acquisitions, what she had, that Rachel didn't have to make Rachel feel like trash. I got a son with some mandrakes, you ain't. So please, she didn't say it in so many words. That your infertility makes you half a woman, the way that Panina did. But she hinted to Rachel that your infertility makes you half a woman. And what did Rachel do? She was sad. She lamented, she complained, she was crying. And frankly, I believe that's what caused the Lord in the scriptures to, what is this, remember Rachel. And then Rachel became with child. She knew her husband Jacob and then was with child. God remembered Rachel because Leah got to a point where, okay girl, I gave you fertility first to have mercy on the fact that you're, you're not the most beloved of your husband. But you don't get to just make the, the, my, the your sister wife slash sister at all. It's life a living nightmare. God has, has a way about, you know, ultimately rewarding breakthrough to the individual in question that just keeps on getting either overtly mocked for not having something or subtly mocked. Both hurt, but the subtle mockery hurts the most because you can't even complain without looking like a jealous freak. Mm. You cannot complain without looking like a jealous freak. And that's, that's why it hurts because you got to swallow that pill like a big giant antibiotic when you've got pneumonia. You got to just swallow it. If you don't swallow it, you will be given character flaws that don't belong to you. They will call you jealous. They will take an opportunity to essentially call you bitter for not having anything. And I'm here to try and encourage Rachel's of these streets, people who are waiting, do you understand? Penhannas of these streets that either have got overt mockers or covert mockers. People who have got people on a rooftop out just slapping them with everything they got while they don't got jab. And also those that are doing it in a subtle fashion. Both hurt the one however more than the other. But I, I want to help the waiting, right? The waiting, those who are waiting on Jesus, because I'm one. I am a classic case of delayed gratification to the nth degree, climbing Mount Everest and coming back down again, and still you ain't got your answered prayer. I am a textbook case of hope deferred makes the heart sick. And a longing fulfilled is a tree of life, but I am yet to have a tree of life. I came to Jesus Christ at the age of 26 and a half, going on 27. And I sought the Lord's face for a husband then. I, at the time of redemption, had a whole thriving career that was doing well. And I was bound for big things. And at the age of 30, 29 going on 30, I lost my career. And 10 years later, I would still be unemployed. 13 years from the time that I asked for a husband. So as soon as I came to Christ at 26 and a half, I'm still single. I don't have children. I don't have a husband. And I don't have a career. Well... Not so much where it is that I want to be because I just got a job. Y'all guys know that, right? I have been highlighting it. Mm. But I lost a very thriving, prosperous career. And so, like I said, I am a textbook case of delayed gratification going up and down Mount Everest. And at the bottom, after enduring all that, with your toes even having to be cut off because you endured shock syndrome from climbing up a freezing mountain. With you having had certain things of yours amputated. You are still waiting. You are still waiting. 13 years waiting for a husband and 10 years waiting for breakthrough deliverance from persecution. And it's still dry. <laughs> and I have had my fair share of either Penina outward mockery of the fact that <laughs> you ain't got check. You don't have a husband. You don't have money. You don't have a job. You don't have your, I've had the guy revving his new SUV outside of my house while I'm still driving my plumes of smoke sedan because it keeps on emitting plumes of smoke 
I've had that boisterous, loud, ornate, showy guy with their acquisitions, but I've also had, and for the large majority, it's been this. So that's why it's hurt the most. I've also had the subtle gloaters. I have had the subtle gloaters all up in my grill, and they've hurt more than the boisterous guy. Mm. If therefore you would listen to any body in these streets counseling you on how to deal with your waiting, I'm that girl. I'm that chick. I'm that human being that's here to give you that encouragement because, man, I've been wearing those shoes. Been walking in them. They're worn out. They are so worn out that, frankly, I'm now walking barefoot with what appears to be mere material on top of my toes. I've, I've worn those shoes and I'm still walking like Johnny Walker because the walking has made me drunk like Johnny Walker. It's made me drunk with affliction. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I have yet to have a longing fulfilled. That is a tree of life. I am still in the sick heart. So I have to encourage myself, hoping to therefore encourage others with me, bring them up with me as we journey through God's deliverance of his saints. You are going to be inclined to be flat ironed when you get your first opportunity to rise. The first little trampoline that God gives you because of having waited for so long, you are going to be so sad and also underestimate the living daylights out of it so bad that you will not see where this is going to take you. You will therefore be inclined to feel like if at all you have tripped up and fallen in the middle of a race and people have run laps while you were still on the ground, above you, beyond you, exceeded you. You might be tempted to not want to lift your weight to get up and run because all you will be thinking about are the number of laps that other people have done while you were down. You will be thinking about the fact that they've done a lap, two laps, three laps, four laps, five laps, six laps, seven laps, eight laps, nine laps, ten laps. And only at the tenth lap, that's when you are able to get up off the ground and run. You will be tempted to just walk the rest of the race because what's the point? You've, you've lost anyway. You will be tempted to just, to maybe even not finish the race. You will be tempted to stay down and mope and feel sorry for yourself. Not put in the kind of effort or energy that you would have if you were all running at the beginning of this race together. In my particular story, I have had people run 10 laps around me. One lap for one year. And with each year that has progressed has been each new single individual year that every one of my enemies has gained work experience. It's every single year that they have uh, gotten married, had children, gotten time to raise them. I'm, I'm 40. So my peers have got kids that are either pre-teens or teenagers. And I don't have any children. 10 laps. 10 laps when I was in my like my, my the first of my friends to fall pregnant fell pregnant when we were like 22 20 yeah 22 the earliest not 21 actually the first friend of mine that fell pregnant was 21 years old 21 I followed then short next after that was my cousin who was 22 so their kids are thoroughly like almost in the trick some of them <laughs> my peers my cousins who were born millennials right Born, let me rather say exennials, born either like in, um, sorry, born either in the late, late 70s or early 80s. They've got teenage kids. <laughs> I have a, a cousin whose boys are a marvel to look at because they, they tower above everybody. And every time I see them, they, 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 they appear even taller than the last time. Ilovara only a week has progressed. They're just growing like weeds and they, they appear to not be stopping any minute now. The one is beyond matric, the other one is exactly in matric. And I remember just yesterday they were like, yay high. And now they're taller than me. And I'm tall. Okay. That's, the, yeah. So when I look at them, my heart, <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I love to watch kids grow. It's a marvel. They're like a National Geographic flower uh, with a time lapse that is sped up. And you just watch it blossom in front of you. It's wonderful to watch them grow. But when you had a desire for children... And to watch a kid enter into a growth spurt that is going to shock the living daylights out of everybody that after two months, Batong, Temba is like literally beyond his mom and he's starting to catch up with the dad. I wanted to experience that. I wanted to watch a kid 
And literally one morning when I wake up, he's taller than me. Like, when did that happen, dude? Like, when did you go past your mom? When did you get taller than me? Like, yesterday, I was feeding you down here. I was giving you money all in there. And now I'm, like, looking at you up there. I wanted to watch that National Geographic flower blossom <laughs> with a time lapse because it happens that fast. And when I watch, when I see it with my cousin's kids, it, it just, it hurts so much. Even though they're a marvel to look at and I love them, they're not mine. The thing that I'm looking at is a miracle in front of me, but it's not my miracle. It's not my miracle, it's my cousin's miracle. She's the mom here that's got sons that are now taller than her. And and that, that bus appears to have just come and gone like that ship appears to have sailed. Where I'm concerned, y'all. That ship has sailed. And with that ship appearing to have sailed, I am being now made to fear that I will never ever get to watch that time lapse. And it sucks. So to be 40 with no children and never been married and to be 40 with, I mean, it's bad enough I don't have kids or a husband, but I don't have a career too, or at least not what I'm supposed to be at. It's like I got Jack, y'all, nothing. For you to be sitting around with 10 laps progressing in people's lives who in that, like, you know, like I said, the, 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 the laps that they're doing are marriages having children, gaining experience in corporate, gaining, um, never mind experience, but accreditations, qualifications, furthering your studies, going for your master's, your doctorate degree, maybe your second degree, starting a business, a side hustle, and it working or not, and you having that experience, therefore, all those things that I was supposed to do all throughout my 30s, just as my peers throughout their 30s did, uh, I was, I was just down the whole time. I was frozen. I was on the ground, you guys. I was on the ground. I had been tripped up. I had fallen during a race on an athletics patch. And I watched people run one lap. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten laps. Ten laps. And only at the, after the tenth lap did somebody offer me an olive branch to stand up and start to try and finish this race. After 10 years, after a decade, you guys, <laughs> a decade, a decade, after a decade, somebody decided finally to give me a hand of help to get up so I can carry on running this race. 10 years, 10 years. When you get given a hand of help after that many laps have progressed, you will be inclined to be like, it's okay, no. You will look at this yawning, gargantuan athletics patch gawking at you ahead of you imagine that you can't run anymore because you've been sitting for 10 years imagine that you've basically gained like you've got muscular dystrophy your fitness is gone you're rusted you are no longer as agile as you were 10 years ago and it sucks that other races are happening that are commencing with is that you commenced your race but by athletes that are so much younger than you. And you now gotta basically run your own race while also looking at the fact that they're running at the from the place where you now are. And they stand to defy you, albeit being so much younger than you. That, 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 guys. Yo, God have mercy. The pain of that is exorbitant. It is astronomical. I can't even fashion the right words for it. I cannot find the right words to fitly describe how this thing actually really feels. Like there's literally no words for it. It is an excruciating pain and the only people that would be able to uh, relate with me are those who have been in my shoes, who have been set back and watched people run laps around them and then got expected to start running. Finishing the race, not start, okay? They already started it, but they gotta finish the race. And because of the fact that they were down for so long, they are yet, like, their stamina has decreased, their strength has decreased, their fitness levels, their muscle girth decreased, and they have to rebuild all that again. Gotta start from some point, so you can't start from exactly where you were, because at the end of the day, you don't get to be down for 10 years. You don't get to be down for 10 laps and run at the same rate. Run at the same rate. You don't get to be down for that long and maintain the same rate, okay? You will be tempted to throw in the towel or do just enough, like, tell yourself stuff like, I, at least, I can walk. Cause before, I was 
in a wheelchair. You will literally be tempted to say, at least I can walk because before I was in a wheelchair, when this is a race, you are supposed to be running. But you will be tempted to just walk. Because what's the point of running? Because I'm never going to catch up. You will tell yourself, what is the point of running? Because I'm never going to catch up. So I might as well just pace myself. This is not going to end well. I'm, I'm never going to catch up. Like, I'm just always going to be behind. Like, just be discouraged from actually giving your all. But Jesus says in his word, through Paul, that 1 Corinthians 10, 30, 10 31. It's Paul, right? Who wrote the book of Corinthians? Stand corrected. But I think it's Paul. He says, whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, do it all for the glory of God. It's also written in God's word that whenever you work, <laughs> you must work heartily as unto the Lord. Not, for, not so much for men. You are working heartily as unto the Lord and not for men. It is also written in God's word in the parable of the talents. That when the Lord gives you talents, you must well and rightly steward them. Don't sit on them. The guy that was given the five talents went and invested them and made five more. The guy that was given two talents invested them and went and made two more. But the guy that was given one talent buried it in the ground and then chilled in a corner. When the master, when the master rocked up and was like, what have you done with your talents? The dude with the five talents was like, I've made five more. The dude with the two talents was like, I've made two more. And the dude with the one talent gave some tall excuse about how it is that I know you're a hard task master and that you don't, you reap, you don't, you saw where you have reaped, etc. So I stand created as to the terminology over there. But he just came up with a tall answer, okay? That was frankly unacceptable. And the master was angry, mad. And his response was, you wicked and slothful servant. You're taking for granted the fact that you know that I don't reap where I have sown. I have sown where I have reaped. You get like get this, the, the accuracy of scripture there, right? Mm -hmm. And so the instruction was given to grab that slothful and wicked servant, bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness. And in that place, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth for all of eternity. The smoke of his torment will rise up forever and there is no rest for him day and night. That's what God did with the slothful servant. That's what the master will do with you not stewarding your gifts and your talents. With you sitting on your gifts, whatever they are, you don't have an excuse even if 10 laps have been run around you while you were down. Even if you were set up for failure, you don't get to say, I know you're a hard task master or... Oh, uh, I was down for 10 years, or uh, I was down for 5 years, or uh, I was down for 2 years. Like, oh, they tripped me up, oh, uh, they messed me up, oh, uh, there was no way I was going to catch up, oh. Uh. The Lord will say to you, you are a wicked and a slothful servant. The Bible in it, God says to Adam after they fell, that you must from now on work by the sweat of your brow. Till the fields, if anybody does not want to work, let them not eat. Hard work is like a whole instruction and a commandment from God. It is written in God's word that... Um, the way that a door turns on it, like a door turning on its hinges, so too does a lazy man turn on his bed. God has a bone to pick with laziness. He says that a little sleep and a little slumber and a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will overwhelm you like an armed man and scarcity like a bandit. You must go and be poor if you don't want to work. That's what the Bible has to say. Uh, the scriptures make it clear that a lazy person puts their hand on a plate of food and is too lazy to bring it up to eat. You just go out and you put food, like your hand, bah, in some cabbage <laughs> and you can't even pick it up. <laughs> Mechanical process of picking it up and putting it in your mouth is just so taxing that you literally will sleep with your hand in your plate of grub. That's what the Bible has to say about lazy people. God could not be bothered by the fact that you feel some kind of way about the fact that you, you, were, you were left for dead on the side of the street. Once he has recovered you to health, once there has been a good Samaritan rocking up to dress your wounds and now you can walk, walk you must. Now you can run, run you must. Now that I have patched up your wounds and healed your brokenness, if at all athletics is what you're supposed to be doing, you're gonna run that patch. You're not gonna walk it. This is not a walkathon. It's a marathon. This is is not a walkathon. This is not 702 walk the talk. This is the comrades marathon. You must run, cause that's what this race is about. He says in his word, when when we die at the end of of this life, when we do well in him and hold fast, being steadfast, 
He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have run the, you, you, you have uh, run the race. You have, well, uh, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have fought the good fight. You have run the race and you have kept the faith. It's about running the race. You don't get to walk it. You don't get to squander your talents like the guy with the one that did not do anything about it but buried in the ground. The dude that decided to bury his talent in the ground was thrown in the outer darkness. That's why the Bible says that we need to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That no matter how we are feeling, look, it's not that God does not care that we feel some kind of way. He has mercy on the fact that we are made of dust, right? He has compassion on us. And he also has mercy for the fact that we feel raw and uh, like, you know, um, harassed and done dirty. He has compassion on that. He is the rewarder of justice and he in and of himself <coughs> is just. So he also hates the inequality <coughs> that hits you. And he is grieved by it too. He is pained by it. And it is his benevolence for us, his omnibenevolence for us, that ought to therefore make us recognize that because he is just and because he has mercy and compassion on your heartbroken state over the fact that you were done dirty, he will therefore then necessarily in his benevolence reward you with justice. He will bring comeuppance to your enemies, but you have to trust him. He knows that you are raw about having been set back. And, but he has given you instructions as to how to be as a Christian. So you don't get to just merely throw in the towel. It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. You don't get to merely just throw in the towel because they did you dirty. So now you're going to just walk lackadaisically like you're walking in the park. The rest of the race, you you, you know, God does not say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have uh, uh, fought the good fight. You have walked the race. You have kept the faith. It's you have run it. Do you understand? So he has understanding and therefore compassion on your raw pain and your disquiet, your righteous indignation about what's been done to you. He gets it, but it's written in God's word that vengeance is of the Lord. It is for the Lord to repay. It is for him to recompense. He is the one that brings comeuppance to your enemies. He is the one that prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He is the one that sets a standard above the devil, even though the enemy comes at you like a flood. He, 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 you know, it's all about his work in that he completes that he begins so therefore it is not for us to take matters into our own hands leaning on our own understanding and drop the ball and drop the ball how can i even better describe this when i was in primary school there was a story this very motivational story that our afrikaans teacher told us of uh, in order to encourage us to keep working hard even when um we don't feel like it anymore okay shout out to mrs Birkus in standard five winchester ridge primary school telling us the story okay 